Good morning. I heard Bob. Good morning. He's still out, did you? <laughs> we are so glad that you're here with us today, that you chose to spend your morning here with us, ready to worship, ready to check out what's going on here. Promise you are in for a treat and a challenge, so I hope that you're ready for that. If this is your first time joining us or your first time in a long time, we especially want to welcome you. We would love to invite you to take out your cell phone and send us a text to 94000, if you will text new, the number two, F-A-C, that'll let us know that you're checking us out for the first time, and we would love to be able to connect with you, to give you a little bit more information about us and what's happening here and all the great things that you can get involved with, and also to give you an opportunity to ask us some questions and find out more about um, how you can plug in, what's going on. Uh, so once again, we are glad that you have chosen to be with us here today. If you are joining us online for the first time, we also want to welcome you. If you'll just type in the chat where you are watching from, we would love to be able to celebrate you joining with us today. You know, this morning on our way to church, a couple hours ago, we were listening to the radio and the DJ came on after a song and, and she was talking and sometimes, sometimes I tune out when they're talking, but this one thing that she said just resonated with me and she said, don't forget that every good thing in our lives has been initiated by God. And while I knew that, I know that, you know that, it was so good to hear that again this morning. Every good thing in our life was initiated by God. So I can't say how excited I am. I hope you're excited too because today we can celebrate the good things in our lives. We might have some bad things, but if we look around, we can see the good. Let's celebrate that today. Will you join us? How about you hop up to your feet? Let's sing together. the 
Let's continue worshiping him this morning.
you guys sound great this morning. You may have a seat. We don't want to stop our time of worship. We're just stopping singing for a little bit to give you an opportunity to give back, to um, be a generous person, a person of generosity. And I know that you've heard it before, but it's so true. God loves a cheerful giver. And maybe you've been around somebody before who was a cheerful giver. They're kind of annoying, right? But it's also really beautiful. I saw that this week in my own children. They were shopping to pack up their Operation Christmas Child boxes. And as we were walking through the store, it was so funny because they had a plan. They had a theme for this box, for this, the girl that we chose You know, she's nameless and faceless, but my kids were excited to give things to her. And as they were going through and putting things in our cart, the joy that came out of them as they were saying, oh, she's gonna love this. She's gonna like this one when she opens it. I learned a lesson. That's the kind of giver that I wanna be. I want to be cheerful when I give, to have that childlike faith of the excitement of being able to put something in a box for someone that you don't even know and you're probably never gonna meet, but to be excited to know that it's going to someone, that they're gonna open this box. This little girl is going to peel this open and she's gonna see these little gifts that really for us were nothing great, nothing special, that box has been prayed over and it's gonna carry the good news of Jesus into her home, into her village, into her world. It's gonna reach around the world and hug another child. I wanna be that kind of cheerful giver because what I know to be true is that only God can have us, help us give something to someone else and fill us up with more joy. That's what I saw this week. They were pouring themselves out, yet they walked away with all the joy. Let's be like that today. If you came ready to give, write your check, put it in the envelope. There are places in the back of the lobby as you leave that you can drop that in. If you didn't come ready to do that today, there are ways that you can do it online. You can text to give, you can visit our website. If you're joining us online, they're gonna put a button up there that you can click and it'll lead you right through the steps to be able to give. Don't miss an opportunity to be like these kids as they're showing us how to be cheerful givers. Let's pray. God, I thank you that you are a God who gives us your joy, even in trials and challenging moments we can hold true to your joy. And we know that when we pour ourselves out, when we give to others, when we give to things that you are a part of, that joy fills us to overflowing. I thank you for opportunities like Operation Christmas Child to be able to pack a simple shoebox and send it across the world to be able to share the good news of the gospel. I thank you that what we give here locally impacts our church, our community, the communities around us, the people right here. I thank you that you love people and you give us an opportunity to love others when we give. So I pray today that we would be cheerful givers, that we would have hearts of generosity to pour out because we know, as we heard again this morning, every good thing that we have was initiated by you. Help us to give to others. God, I pray for each gift. I pray for each giver that you would pour out your blessings, that you would continue to use the resources that come in to impact the world for your name. We want to make you famous through a shoebox, traveling around the world, right here in our community. God, we lift you high. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Will you join us again? Stand to your feet.
Let's continue worshiping him.
that we have joy in our hearts because of the joy set before us in Christ Jesus, that we can lean in on you and be filled with hope and peace every day because we know as your word says that you have new mercies for us every day, that when we are down, that when we are destitute, when we're sad, when we're depressed, when we're anxious, we can always call on your name and you will always hear our cry. So Lord, I thank you for that. I thank you for the transformative, redeeming love of Christ in our lives. And so Lord, as we prepare to hear this message, we just ask that you continue to make our hearts malleable and that we be people that not only receive truth, but then go out and choose to walk in the truth, to be people who live the truth every day, offering our bodies as living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to you. So Lord, we pray this in the name of Jesus and God's people said, amen. You may be Amen. Seen. Amen. Thank you guys so much. Great stuff. I think we all need that reminder on occasion. We all need that reminder of a cross and the one who took on that cross for the sake of our sin. The one who carries the burden that should rightfully be ours to carry. We all need that reminder that the same spirit that actually breathed life back into Jesus, brought him back to life, up out of the grave, that same spirit lives inside of us this morning. Amen. We have some hope in that. That can bring us a sense of confidence and encouragement in the midst of the darkest and most trying times in the midst of that battle that, that we just sang about a moment ago. Because we are in a battle. And that's what we've been talking about for the past several weeks. We're coming to the conclusion of this series looking at, uh, today we're looking at the last piece of the armor of God in this series that we've been in entitled what? Dress Code. Exactly. We'll wrap up the series next week as we kind of look at the last little bit that Paul has to say. But today we look at that last piece of the armor that Paul uh, shares with us as he outlines this spiritual battle that every single one of us are engaged in, whether we realize it or not. So last week, uh, for all of you that were here or with us online, uh, we talked about faith, right? We talked about faith being that, that position that we take where we act as though what God has spoken is true, right? And I don't know about you, but there are some days when it's just that. It's not knowing, it's not having a clue how this thing is going to turn out, but God, you said it, so I'm going to cling to that. Amen? Uh, I, and I don't know about you, but through the course of this series, I've found that more and more that as we've leaned into what it means to, to suit up, to have his truth encircling our lives, to walk in righteousness, to cling to the hope of our salvation and to share who he is with others, the gospel of peace. I, I don't know about you, but it feels like uh, maybe more fiery arrows have been shot at me as of late. Anybody else experiencing that? Uh, yep, that's pretty much how it goes. But that's why we need that shield of faith, acting like what God has spoken is true, a shield for our good and, and for the good of others, that we can cover them, that we can carry them, that we can come alongside of them in the midst of the battle and, and be there one with another because we were not made to do this in isolation. You were not made to do this thing called life in isolation. Christ wants us to be connected with one another in fellowship and in, in communion with one another. So we're gonna continue. Like I said, we're gonna look at the last piece of this armor that we have listed out for us. We're going right back to Ephesians chapter six. So if you got a Bible, flip that. Man, lightning over here. Good night. I didn't even get it out. And she said, got it. So flip into Ephesians chapter six. We're going to look as we have every week at verse 13. And then we'll jump to 17. For those of you online, you can just click that tab up there and search Ephesians chapter six. And somebody already beat all of you to it. But uh, when the rest of you have got it, let me know that you've got it. Ephesians chapter six. Very good. Very good. Ephesians chapter six. I'll give you just a moment more. And then we're going to read 
verse 13 and jump to the second part of 17. It says this, this is Paul writing once again to us, therefore take up the whole armor of God. Friendly reminder, we don't pick and choose the pieces. We take it all. We need faith, we need truth, we need to carry the gospel of peace, we need righteousness, we need to cling to the hope of our salvation and what we're going to see today. All of these pieces make up the armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. And then verse 17 says this, and take, we talked about in the first week, the helmet of salvation And he goes on to say, and the sword of the spirit, which is the what? The word of God, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of the God, uh, word of God. Now, I'm just going to throw this out there uh, because I think, I think it holds pretty true. If you think throughout uh, literature and you think throughout movies uh, of our time, of our day, what you will find is as you look at those, you often find that, that great warriors, there, there's a, a direct connection to their weapon, right? Uh, so let me give you an example. Do we have any C.S. Lewis and Chronicles of Narnia fans in the room? Okay, some of you will know this one right off the top when I show it. Anybody know who this is? That's Peter, exactly. So Peter, he's got the sword and he's got the shield. He's kind of decked out in the whole thing. So I'm just going to say this. Uh, it's weird for me with my background, but I think it's worth mentioning. If you are kind of new to faith and, and you're new to Christianity, I encourage you, along with reading scripture, this would be a great series for you to grab by C.S. Lewis called The Chronicles of Narnia because it's just a great powerful picture of who God is to us, but it's a cool story too as well. So if you've never gotten that, grab it. Here's one uh, for all of you heathens like me. How about this? (coughs) I show you a C.S. Lewis character and you're like, who is that? Know this one though, don't we? William Wallace, Braveheart, right? He's got the big old massive sword that could just lop off someone's head and did (laughs) just just massive right he's got his sword with him we know him by his sword I've got another one for you how about this guy right here my name is Senigo Montoya you kill my father prepare to die right I love this movie and you're like our pastor's weird but th- this is a great one. Like you can't disconnect Anigo Montoya from his rapier and the six-fingered man, right? Just good stuff. Or how about this one? A little more uh, on the edgy side. Let's show you one more here, right? Obi Wan and his lightsaber, or or any of them, and their lightsaber. Right? Here's the thing. This is the idea. Okay. When I show you any of those images. We connect those, and it's, and it's for this reason. Look at this statement right here. It's because the two are connected. Warrior and sword. They're connected to one another. When we see those images, we, we envision them with a sword, right? We, we don't envision Enigo Montoya saying, you killed my father, prepare to die, without having that rapier in his hand. We would never envision hearing William William Wallace saying, they'll never take our freedom without a sword in his hand. The warrior and the sword, the two are connected. Now, let me read something to you. This is from from Pew Research, a study they did a few years ago. Uh, For the the church goers, the the folks who grew up in church, maybe you hear you online, we hear Pew and we automatically think of right? Like a bench that was really hard because they refused to allow you to get even remotely comfortable. Uh, But like, that's what we think of. But Pew Research, it's actually a name. It has nothing to do with church. It's it's a a nonpartisan think tank and fact tank that they just put together data from surveys that they do. But listen to this. According to Pew Research, a study done uh, just a couple of years ago, uh, three or four years ago, 75% of Christians believe that the Bible is the word of God. 
That's good, right? No, 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 hang with me, because I know some of you are like, wait a minute, that's kind of messed up. But well, let's, I, I, our staff all the time, we have to remind one another, don't we? Let's celebrate the good, and then we'll deal with the other. 75% of Christians do believe that this is the word of God. That's good. I don't know about the other 25%. <laughs> we'll work on that. But 75% of Christians believe the Bible is the word of God. This is where it starts to change a little bit, Okay. When it comes to reading the Bible with regularity, okay, only 20, 29%, only 29% read it at least once a week. 13% responded saying they read it a couple of times a year. 44% of those surveyed said they don't read the Bible. Now, you hear that, and I can't help but throw this out. It's no wonder that we as Christ followers have become so deficient in our faith. It's no wonder we struggle because we've got warriors left and right going to battle with no sword. We've got warriors that are out there facing very real battles. Some of you in this room, myself included, some of you online, facing very real battles of, of, of worry and anxiety and depression and fear and heartache, hopelessness and loneliness, bitterness and anger and pride. And we're fighting these battles with nothing in our hand to go to war. The warrior and the sword, the two are connected. And we've got to get back to that place in our faith as Christ followers, where we realize that this is not just some archaic collection of stories. It is something given to us to use as a weapon in our fight against a very real enemy that is doing everything he can to take us out. And, and, and I know Please understand, I know, especially coming out of a guy who's relatively young, sometimes this sounds archaic, I feel like, in today's church. Like we've drifted away from saying this, we need to read it, we need to make it a part of our lives. But until we recognize that, we're going to war swordless. So what does it mean for us? What does it mean to take up our sword? We're going to look at Paul's words. We're going to look at some words of another great warrior uh, in this Bible, in this piece that we call scripture, this collection. But what does it mean for us to take up our sword? Three things that we're going to look at real quick. And the first is this, for us to take up our sword means we need to know it. Look at somebody beside you, type it in online, say know it. I love y'all, but that was about 22% participation. And I'm not okay with that. I love you. Say somebody, know it. Know it. know it. know it. We have to know the word. Know what it says. A few passages for you real quick. You can look these up later and we're going to look at one. But listen to this. Joshua chapter 1 verse 8. It says, this book of the law. Now please understand at this point. Uh, the reference is not to the entirety of scripture that we now have, but it was still the word of God to his people. The book of the law, this book of the law, shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. Everybody say day. day. Everybody say night. night. Day and night. So that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. Psalm chapter one, verse two speaks about the blessed man. And it says that of the blessed man, his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on this law, he meditates, take a guess. Y'all are so good, so good. And look at this one. Psalm 119, verse 10 and 11. This is David, okay? David, you wanna talk about a warrior, this guy was a warrior. And I'm just going to tell you, if you're in a position today where you're like, ah, you know, I don't really read the Bible because it's boring. You're reading the wrong one. Because I'm telling you, there are stories in here 
that if we turn them into movies, number one, they would immediately get a rated R rating. <laughs> number two, we would be like, oh, I can't believe that happened. We would totally flip out. I mean, you're talking about a guy here who at one time when he was just a kid took a rock, buried it in a giant's forehead to the point that it actually brought the giant to the ground. And then as if that wasn't enough, David took a sword and well, you know, it's bad. It's straight at R if I say it. So there was bad stuff that happened after that. So this is coming from the pen of a warrior. and He says this. With my whole heart, I seek you, God. Let me not wander from your commandments, from your truth, from your teaching. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Each of those passages that we just read. This passage right here, Paul's words, all of them point to a dependency that we have to have on the words of God in order to live the life Christ has called us to. The life that Christ has created us for, that we have to lean into it. Joshua and David, Paul, they all speak of this intentional and constant reflection and meditation day and night on the word of God. The emphasis is on us knowing it. Knowing what God has promised to us and what he said about us. Knowing what God wants, yes, from us, but also what he wants for us. We have to be a people who know it. In fact, look at this. We need to be a people who become confidently familiar with the word of God. Not, not something casual. Not, not something that we just take it as, well, it, you know, might have a good piece of advice here and there. When Paul speaks of this piece, he refers to it as a sword. Here's the tough question for all of us, again, myself included. The question is this, are we confidently familiar enough with his word that we can actually wield it in war? Do we know this? Not, not, just, not just, you know, a few verses that are conveniently painted on some lovely decor at Hobby Lobby. But like, do we know it? Are we so confidently familiar with it that when faced with battle, we know what to do? I've got a buddy of mine. Uh, he's been in law enforcement for, for years. And uh, not too long ago, about, about two years ago, he and I were having a conversation kind of going back and forth because I wanted to ask him some questions um, about how, how many of you like going to the range and shooting? Anybody? Yeah? So I was asking him some questions. I had started kind of getting back into it and, uh, and I was asking him, hey, you know, Rob, Rob, if you're watching, love you, buddy. Uh, I said, Rob, doing what you do as a profession, I'm, I would assume that you have to be pretty confident with your weapon and, and knowing what to do. And he said, oh yeah, yeah, definitely. I said, so how often do you go to the range? Cause I, you know, I don't go, I, the fact that the matter is I don't go near as much as someone should if they want to know how to utilize a weapon properly. But I said to him, how much time do you spend on the range? Because everything I've heard about good marksmen is they take that time. And he said, oh, it's ours. It's, I said, that's perfect. I, I was wondering if that's what you would say if you really do spend a lot of time to do that. And he stopped me and he said, but Nate, it's really, it's, it's about more than that. He said, to, to be familiar with my weapon, he said, it's not just about going to the range and range time. And he said this, and I quote, these are his words. He said, a lot of it is really about fine tuning the little things. 
working with an empty weapon, working on the correct grip, trigger manipulation, sight alignment. And then he said this, this is what I love. You ready for this? He said, it's really about knowing how to handle the weapon before you need to use it. Being familiar with it. See, if there's ever a truth that should apply to the Christ follower, to you, to me, to us, if there's ever a truth that should apply is that we need that kind of confident familiarity. We need to be in this regularly. We need to be learning it, sound teaching. We need to be reading it often, not once every now and then. And once every week, that's good. But more than that, we need to be in it, reading it. We need to study it. We need to know its context, who it was written to, why it was written to them, the historical context. Because I can tell you, anytime we actually take the time to do that, it will illuminate things about what we're reading. Now, all of a sudden, the stories begin to make sense as we put them into the proper context. We, we need to be seeking wisdom from people who have spent time in it, with it, who know how to actually utilize it properly, immersing ourselves knowing our sword well, knowing what God has said, what he's doing in our world, a, a, an understanding of our salvation and how he's changing us to become more like him and working through us, confidently familiar, knowing it all so that when the battle does come, because it is coming, amen? Amen. So that when the battle does come, we're ready. Because here's what I've learned in my time on this planet. That when the battle gets really difficult and I'm facing spiritual battles of, of anger and anxiety and frustration and disappointment and things taking place in my home and in my family and, and in my work. What I have found is it's in those moments, I don't have the luxury of the phone a pastor option. I love my pastor dearly. Pastor Andy Craver, great man of God, love him. I talk to him often. That dude texts me every single Sunday and says, I'm praying for you this morning. You've got a word in you. Go and deliver it in boldness and in faith. Every Sunday he does that for me. Love that guy. It's good. So oh, okay then. <laughs> there you go, Andy, it's working. Uh, I love him, but this is what I know. In those moments where it gets really difficult, I don't have the luxury of being able to get a hold of him right away and say, Andy, I just, I, you know, I need to know what the word says about this. Help me. I, I've got to know it. I've got to be familiar with it. You do, <laughs> well, I've got Google. I can look it up. Listen, let me tell you what happens when you Google verses on fear. You'll find a bunch of verses with the word fear, and you'll end up taking them out of context and trying to apply them to your life, and they don't do you any good because that's not actually what the passage was talking about. Right? Right? It's like when you go to play a soccer game or a basketball game and you're like, we're going to do this, guys. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's not what that verse is about. <laughs> Paul was in prison. He was being beaten and mocked and ridiculed for his faith. And he was saying, I know I can get through this, God, because you're in me. He wasn't like, boys, let's score a touchdown for the Gipper. That's not what that was about. We need to understand it and know it so that we can apply it properly. I heard this. I wish I had put this on the screen. I didn't know. But listen, Jerome, one of the early church fathers, he said this, ignorance of scripture is ignorance of Christ. Think about that. John records it for us. In the beginning was the, and the word was, and the word was God and the word became and dwelt among us so to not know scripture is to not have a proper understanding of Christ Nate, I, that's why I read the gospels no 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 hang on you got to understand that to know Christ is to look beyond the gospels 
To know Christ is to recognize that there is a scarlet thread that runs from the very beginning all the way to the very end. To recognize that within scripture, we see the promise of a redeemer of hope in Genesis. We make our way through the lives of Noah, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and see the promise of a coming one. We go to the prophets who actually prophesy about the Messiah, the Savior that will come. We get into the gospels. We get to watch the life and the ministry of the very Lamb of God sacrificed for our sins. We read the letters that come after that and about how because of what he has done, we have now have hope in Jesus Christ. We get to the end of the book and we discover we have a soon coming king who is returning again. It's not one piece, one portion. It's the whole thing. The whole thing points us to who Christ is and the hope that we have in him. We have to know it. But it's not only that we have to know it, we also have to live it. Uh Uh-oh, that's where it gets hard, at least for me. It's not enough to just know it. The sword has to become a part of who I am, Bob. Like it, it actually has to be a defining piece of my life that it is so directly connected to my way of life. And when people look at me, that they don't just see me, they see Christ, they see God, they see the Holy Spirit, and they see that this is working its way out in my life. Think of it this way. Some of you may get this, you may not. It's a little bit older. Literature reference and a Disney movie reference and other movie reference. I'm going to say the name of a weapon and then I wanna see how many of you can say a person that's connected to right after I say it. You ready? Excalibur. There you go. I didn't have to give you anything else, did I? All I had to say was Excalibur. Ah, I didn't say this in the first one. We should live in such a way that when someone says the Bible, our name comes to mind in the best way possible. We should live in such a way that when people talk about this sword, that people go, oh yeah, I know somebody at work that's always quoting scripture. (laughs) I know somebody at work. They, They come to lunch and it's written on their brown bag. I know somebody at school. I know this kid at school. Every time I see him, scripture, scripture. Right? It should become a part of who we are. We should live this out. David, going back to what he said, Psalm 119, verse 11, look at this right here. He says, I have stored up your word in my heart. I've committed it to my heart, to my mind, to my life, that I might not sin against you. He says, I've stored it up. That's good. We should have on reserve word. That when we go through difficult situations, pops up. What we should have stored up in our hearts versus that immediately when we struggle with worry, that, that we hear the words of Jesus saying, do not worry about today, for tomorrow has enough worry about itself. Don't you know that I clothe the grass of the field and I feed the birds of the air? How much more then will I care for you? See, we should have have these little reservoirs. And listen, I'm not saying you gotta be able to quote everything word for word and know exact, but, but you should have a reservoir, a reserve of that word in you stored up. Why? David tells us, he says, thy word or your word, I have stored up in my heart. He doesn't say this. I've stored up your word in my heart so that I can argue someone down into the ground. (laughs) He doesn't say that. He doesn't say that. I know it feels good. Don't get me wrong. It feels good to be right. Amen? Amen. Okay, so there's five honest people in the room today. No, it feels good, but that's not why we store up his word in our hearts. He doesn't say, I've stored up your word in my heart so I can make sure my husband knows what a loser he really is. Equal opportunity. He doesn't say, I've stored up my word, your word in my heart so I can let my wife know what a nag she is. Do you realize that there are actually scriptures about both of those? And they can be used improperly 
to attack a person when they're there for a whole different purpose. And we see it outright expressed in David's words. What does he say? I have stored up your word in my heart. Watch this as it switches that I might not sin. Raise your hand if you are I. 100% participation. Online. I. I've stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin. David said, I hide his word in my heart so that I can live out his word in my life. I hide his word in my heart so that my actions will come more into alignment with his heart. What he desires for me and from me. You could sum up the statement to say this. What I now know, I now do. It's not enough to know it. We actually have to practice what we know. It's not enough to hear those words. We actually have to apply those words and live them out. We had an occurrence uh, just recently. It it always happens like this, which is fun. But uh, just recently, we're one child. I will not name names and nobody else should either. Um, But there was one child in my family that had eaten as much of their Culver's custard as they could. That was it. They, there was some left and they just said, I can't eat anymore. I already have a fundamental problem with that, Steve, because I don't understand how anybody has Culver's custard left. Like it's done and I'll eat yours if you can't finish it. It's more like that. But I had one that said, this is, this is all that I can eat. And so the response was, what do I do with it? So mama said, okay, I need you to hold it until we get home And then we'll take it and throw it away. I need you to hold it with your hands till we get home. Yes, mom. Did you hear what I said? Yes. Hold it with your hands until we get home. We pull into the neighborhood and hear those infamous words. Uh Uh-oh. Have you ever had a moment as a parent where you know what the answer is to the question you're about to ask, but you're still so dumb you ask the question anyway? I said, what what do you mean, uh uh-oh? I spilled it. You you spilled the, the ice cream, the custard? Yes, I spilled it. Why, what happened? Well, I had put it in the cup holder in the door. And then when I reached to pull it back out, the top came off and so I just spilled it. Wait, what? You put it in the cup holder in the door. My wife says, that's not what I said to do. I said to hold it with the cup holders that God gave you. cup holders that's why they're there I said I said oh I almost said it (laughs) I said child your mama said to hold it with your hands till we got home did you understand that yes then why did you put it in the cup holder I don't know (laughs) why and see, here's what we laugh at that, and it's funny, and we've all had that experience as parents, sometimes way more extreme than that, where we said, don't you know better? I've taught you better. I've told you. I told you what to do. You said you heard me. And then you did the thing that was opposite of the thing I told you to do. Why did you do that? And see, we laugh, but the thing is, that same principle holds true in our lives as Christ followers. It does us no good to say that we know what God has said about a thing, but then not do what God has said. 
This is brutally honest, but let me just throw this out here. What I know about God and his word matters very little if I'm not willing to do what he said. And in the Christian life, we cannot just be about knowing the word. We have to live the word. That's why James said this in James chapter one, he writes this, for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he goes on after this, he says, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror, right? Stares at it right there. Studying, getting some wrinkles right there, getting some right up here. I got a scar now because I'm stupid. My hair's getting gray, so now I shave it down on the sides so you can't see it. My wife thinks it's distinguished, though. Stares at his face in a mirror. And the next verse after this says, and then goes away and forgets what he looks like. (laughs) James James is using comedy here because he was a great communicator. And he was saying, that's dumb, isn't it? To look at your face and then walk away and go, I forgot what I look like. That's what it means to hear God's word, to know it, but not live it. Jesus himself said, recorded in Luke chapter six, he said, for a man who hears this word of mine and doesn't do it is like a man who builds his house with no foundation. What's the point? We have to be willing to live it. And that's where the battle's won. Not just in the knowing, but actually living it out. You may say, so what do we do? How do we do that? Don't overcomplicate it. Y'all have heard me say this phrase before. It's not even my phrase. When it comes to obedience in Christ, don't overcomplicate it. Listen to God. Do what he says. That's it. It's not that hard. Listen to God. Do what he says, right? If you read in here and you discover that it says, don't lie, Y'all are good. That's solid right there, right? If we read in here that it says, don't steal. And if you are currently stealing, stop it, right? If it says, honor your father and mother, honor your father and mother. If it says, don't exasperate your children. Again, all things that are in there, then stop exasperating your children. What does that look like? Sometimes it's you keep pushing and poking and kicking and not literally I'm just saying you keep prying into things and they need a little breathing room sometimes it's you saying things just to get them stirred up I know no parent has ever (laughs) done that and since the students are clapping for the first time ever when I've preached When it says, honor your father and mother so that your days might be full, recognize that if you don't honor your mother and father, you're going to (laughs) die. Listen to God, do what he says. When he says love all people, it doesn't mean you have to agree with every decision they make or everything that they do, but still love them. Show them the love of Christ. And as the Holy Spirit brings to your attention verses and stories within this, a practical means is to just sit down and say, how can I now see what I have read become a reality in my life? How can I see this work itself out in my life and then live it out? Whatever life throws at you, I promise you, this sword has a solution for you to fight back. Finances, Proverbs, marriage, Ephesians, Song of Solomon, Proverbs, Colossians. There's a bunch for that one. Words of Jesus. You you, you need solutions on parenting. Again, same thing. Go to Proverbs, go to Ephesians. You need a word on what to do in times of despair, the Psalms, lamentations, how to handle all of these. There is something in here that will speak to that situation, but we have to be willing to get into it, know it, and live it. And then last, and I'm done. Y'all are like, man, he's going forever today. That's all right. Know it, live it, use it. Just use it. And when we talk about using it, again, 
We're, we're not diving deep here, but it is practical. When we talk about using it, it means that we have to be willing to step up and wield it for our sake, for our own sake. We have to be willing to get out there and swing that sword. Now, I know this goes without saying, because it's pretty obvious, <coughs> excuse me, but it's worth noting this. As you go through these verses, 10 all the way down through 16 and even the first part of 17, what you see over and over within the gear are pieces that are used for defensive purposes. Then we come to the word of God, which Paul refers to, look at it again, Ephesians chapter six, right here. He refers to it as what? A sword. So all of a sudden we transition from how do we stand firm? How do we hold our ground? How do we maintain a defensive posture to all of a sudden, and I got one more for you so that you can start swinging back. That we weren't ever intended to cower in fear. Just hoping that we make it through this battle. No, we've been given something that when our enemy, and please hear me when I say our enemy, because what we were referring to is not a person. We are referring to the devil himself. I don't believe in the devil. Well, you should start. Because odds are, if you don't believe in him, he's probably kicking your tail. I'm just saying. Don't confuse the people in your life with the real enemy. Don't confuse your spouse with the real enemy when you find yourself in a season where you're constantly butting heads, right? Okay, maybe not. Where, where, where you're, where you're kind of at each other. Don't confuse the tension between the two of you as being she's your enemy or he's your enemy when in reality, the enemy is the one who's come in, who's chosen to plant doubts and questions and tension and frustration. Don't, don't, don't confuse the person in your workplace or the person at school as being the enemy. Use the sword against your real enemy. And when we think of a sword, right? Just like William Wallace or when I mentioned Excalibur, a lot of times we think of what's referred to as a knightly sword. Those huge monstrous blades that take two hands just to wield them, right? Right? A knightly sword that typically would have measured uh, in our measurements somewhere around 45 inches total with a 36 inch blade. And we think, yes, that's, I like that. That's good. But here's the thing, the, the sword specifically that Paul would have been referring to as he again used this Roman uh, warrior, this Roman soldier imagery would have been a gladius. And it would have looked more like this, Okay. This is another one of those archaeological finds. And the gladius, not 45 inches with a 36-inch blade, usually more like 24 inches with maybe a 16 to 8 in, 18-inch blade. A lot shorter, a lot smaller. And we know this is supported by Paul's language because he uses a Greek word that would actually refer to a short sword or a dagger used for stabbing. The idea here is that for every single one of us who call ourselves Christ followers and lean into him to know his word, to live his word, there will come a point where the battle is no longer a distance, but when Satan gets right in your face. All of a sudden, the battle's not at work. The battle comes home. All of a sudden, it's in your marriage. It's with your kids. It's an attack on your health and on your body. And he's no longer shooting those fiery arrows from a distance. Now he is full on nose to nose battle. And in that moment, it makes far more sense to have a weapon you can draw and thrust to gain back ground than to have something you've got to pull out with some kind of cumbersome motion that you don't know exactly how to wield in close combat. 
The sword is there so that we have it to use when the battle is right there in our faces. The enemy's lying to us. The enemy's deceiving us in our homes, with our families. And we have to be ready to use that sword. Why? You ever seen one of those movies before where somebody's getting chased or they're in trouble? In their, in their own house, even, they hear a noise, right? And maybe they're upstairs. And there's always like, some, some of them, it's like spot on, but some of these, you see there's some kind of disruption in the house. And so they grab a lamp, like it's gonna do something. And then they look at it, right? And they kind of shake their head and throw it down. And then maybe they make their way to the kitchen and they start rummaging through drawers and they pull out a meat tenderizer. And the... No, and they throw it out. And finally, they make their way, what, to a butcher's block or something, and they find a knife, and they're like, yeah, 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 this is it. Right? See, that right there is the picture for many of us walking through the Christian life. Because I'll just throw this out. I think that many times, just like in those movies, we find ourselves in the midst of a crisis, in the midst of a difficult moment when the enemy is beating down. And we just start grasping for whatever we can find when we need to go straight to the word, the sword, and ready to use it. We start grabbing for whatever we can find. We're going through a difficult season and we go grab a self-help book. And they're good. There's some good ones out there, right? But we go to that first when we should have gone to him and to the sword first. Where we go, we grasp at whatever we can, the advice of a friend, which will be good and helpful. But if all we're doing is grasping at all of those outside alternatives, when he has given to us things we need, words we need that can actually apply to the situation, then we're swordless. We need to use it, to wield it, to swing it. And we need to know that when we do, it will work. Go read Matthew chapter four this afternoon. You'll see the interaction when Jesus was taken to the wilderness and he was tempted by Satan himself. And if you go look at that, what you'll find is as Satan brought up questions of doubt, which he's doing to us many times, trying to get us to doubt what we know to be true about ourselves. As Satan brought up questions of doubt with Jesus, as he started promising him all the things of this world, which by the way, Satan can promise you that you will find satisfaction in those things all day long. But I guarantee you that satisfaction will only last for a season and you will ultimately end up feeling empty and void and broken. As Satan did all of those things with Jesus, Jesus every single time quoted back to him words that the father had already spoken. Jesus didn't just reply. Jesus, God in the flesh, did not just reply in and of himself. He quoted back scriptures to actually fight back. And that's what we need in the church, that we don't just stand firm, that we start taking background, that we start saying to the enemy, no, this is my family. No, these are my kids and you don't get to have them. No, this is my marriage and you don't get to have it anymore. I will fight you to the very end with the truth of God's word in order to make sure you understand that I win because he is one. That's what it means to wield it for ourselves, And it's not just enough to wield it for ourselves. And I'll close with this because I've gone long. We have to wield it for others. We've seen this time and time again. The armor is not just about us. It's not just about us. We're part of a family, but we're part of an army. Together, connected. The faith coming alongside one another, covering and caring. The same holds true for this sword of the spirit, the word of God. That's why Paul wrote, to a young pastor by the name of Timothy and said that this, this word is living and it's good for teaching and encouraging. It's good for correcting, training. God gives us this word, not just for ourselves, but so that we can actually see it do its work in the lives of others. 
those around us. That's why the writer of Hebrews, who many think might have been Paul, wrote this, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul, of spirit, joints, and of marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. We wield it for others because this has the ability to cut, to pierce through to the very heart of a matter in someone's life, a struggle they're facing, something they're going through. This has that ability. If we know it, if we live it, and if we're willing to use it. So what do we do this week? I want to encourage you. If, uh, if you want to, to look at a little bit more, uh, we actually did a series back at the beginning of this year called Foundations, where we talked a little bit more about the word and how we have to uh, rightly understand it and put it in its proper context. Go back, there's, there's a series on Facebook on our page called Foundations. And if you go look at week one of Foundations, you can dig in a little bit more teaching on the word, the sword of the spirit. But this week, I want to challenge every single one of us, again, self-included, every single one of you, I want to challenge us to be in the word every single day this week. Once a week is good, but typically that means it happens in this kind of a setting. Every single one of us, let's be in it. Seven day challenge from this week to next week. And listen, it doesn't, you don't, you don't have to spend 30 hours from 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. on your knees, on gravel, reading it for it to be effective, okay? I'm talking like, just make the commitment these next seven days to say, I'm gonna spend some time, five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, whatever it is, and I'm gonna hone in on a verse or a group of verses or a chapter, and I'm gonna read it. And if you're like, well, I don't know what to read, get a Bible app. There's several of them out there. I love the YouVersion Bible app. It's one I use that has tons of reading plans. Get into the word every single day this week. Also, commit a verse to memory. Start making that treasury, storing up that word in your heart. And I promise there will come an occasion this week that the verse that you're working to memorize will apply to something going on in your life. Commit a verse to memory. Not Jesus wept, okay? <laughs> Go lit, no, I'm kidding. I actually have one lady that I got to talk to after the first service. And she said, you know, I'm actually thinking that I'm going to make that my verse this week because she's going through a bunch of stuff. And she said, you know what I love about this verse is it reminds me that he connects with my pain. I said, Shh, go ahead, memorize that. <laughs> go for it. Memorize something, then live it out, use it. Quote it when you're discouraged, when you're hurting. Use it to celebrate when things go right. Jesus, we love you. We thank you for this time together. And I pray that as we leave from this place, we would be encouraged and challenged. If, God, if there's one person in this room that today they're, they're trying to wrap their minds and hearts around this because they don't know you, but I pray they wouldn't leave this place without letting us talk to them and encourage them. Maybe you're here, maybe you're online and, and you say, Nate, I've never given my life to Jesus Christ. I've never prayed to ask him to forgive me and confess my sins and, and declare that he died on that cross and rose from the grave for me. If today is the day that you say, I want to begin that relationship with Jesus, just in this moment, everybody else has still got their heads bowed and eyes closed. Will you be bold enough? Just raise your hand and just wave it right beside your head. Just look at me. Make sure I catch you. You say, today, I've never prayed a prayer asking for forgiveness of my sins. But today, I want to do that. You online, same thing. You're going to have an option, opportunity to do that. But for any of you, if that's you, don't leave today without us praying with you and encouraging you. Father, we love you. We thank you for this time together. We pray it in Jesus' name, amen.